thank you to everyone for being here and coming together in the spirit of community of learning and we really know that we'll all leave quite nourished here i do want to uh, to, to to close on the on the protocol side of things um a special welcome to our key partners, Dr. Elizabeth Kish, uh, Warden and CEO of the Rhodes Trust, uh, her colleague Ben Russell, as well as Evie O'Brien, who's the Executive Director of the Atlantic Institute. Um, these partners of ours uh, work within the global context of some of the important conversations and questions that are being posed in tonight's key address about how we really find our common humanity in living in these very divided I want to welcome and thank all the scholars and alumni who are on board, uh, and of course, Lebu, who I will do a little bit of an introduction to. So I do think it's important for us to locate ourselves in the day that we are in. What does it mean to con convene uh, on Mandela Day at one of the worst weeks of civic unrest in the history of South Africa's democracy? We have watched with disbelief uh, as chaos and violence has spread, and how the fractures in our society have really quickly opened into chasms. So we know that we are a divided place, but it has been painful to see how quickly we were able to turn on one another. Mm -hmm. In a sense, Madiba would have been deeply pained by what we have seen this week. But yet equally, it is the spirit of Mandela that is able to come with courage at facing the pain and the division and equally, he would have found such hope and inspiration in the stories of the many ordinary people's resilience, resourcefulness, and moments of humanity and mutual aid that we saw. So we know that at times it's hard to reconcile Madiba's vision for South Africa, uh, for the continent and, and, and the world, you know, especially thinking about um, how difficult it is to to imagine reconciling people uh, in, in, with injustices that still exist. And indeed, we know that sometimes it might seem impossible, but you know, his legacy connects us and calls on all of us as Mandela Road scholars, as Africans, as global citizens to dig deeper than we ever have into our humanity so that we can really heal and find ways to really truly shift the structural inequalities that continue to divide um, and dehumanize us. So today I'm really pleased to introduce someone that we know and believe can hold these tensions of hope and despair in a very beautiful, authentic way. And, you know, Lebo Mashile is really someone that we believe is a perfect person to address us today. Lebo is an award-winning poet, author, presenter, actress, and uh, a producer, so very multi-talented um, uh, human being. She previously acted in the Academy Award nominated film Hotel Rwanda, a stage adaptation of K. Selo Dekas' The Quiet Violence of Dreams, as well as Ngi Dancer, which is a stage adaptation of Pamela Noveta's autobiography. Um, Venus versus Modernity, the life of uh, Sarki Batman marked uh, Mashila's first foray in penning a full-length uh, theoretical production. Lebo won the Noma Award for Publishing in Africa in 2006 for her premier collection, A Ribbon of Rhythm. 2008, she released Flying Above the Sky, her second book of poetry. Lebo, of course, has many more accolades, which would take us another 30 minutes for me to go through. But really, for us, what inspires us and what is drawing us to have her tonight is her ability to hold complexity and to courageously and curiously explore what lies beyond and divides. And this, of course, is most inspiring to us as the MRF. And we deeply resonate with this concept key values is embracing complexity. So we're privileged to hear your thoughts, Lebo, on the topic Mandela's legacy in a divided world. I invite all our guests, scholars, staff, and alumni, accept this invitation to be present in this moment in time and everything it holds, and listen with open hearts and our special guest, Ms. Lebo Khan, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Judy. Thank you for that loving and kind and passionate introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you to all of you who are in the house tonight for being incredibly patient. I just want to double check how much time we still have, just in case I need to condense my speech a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, work with 30 minutes and if you need a bit okay. more shit, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I'd like to start with some poems and I will, of course, be peppering my um, presentation with poetry as well. Um, I've had an extraordinary day. The speech that I'd written out that was prepared beautifully on my laptop, I cannot access. So this forces me to speak from memory, but also to speak from my heart, which maybe is what was probably intended for me to do with all of the calamities that have happened. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Um, it always helps me to be able to call on my ancestors to just ground myself. So I'd like to start there and, and share that with you first. Ke mathaba tla di se rotha ka mosela ntheng ya thaba magale a se go gobele re matshilwane a shibe a shilana kala moshidi ka moswa a shila tlhogo tsa batho rena ba maswi ka maramaga e ke go maya tshilwane we call on memories very deep inside skeletons of the first people to walk the skin of the earth who nursed and nested in the cradle and spread civilizations across the planet like seeds. Tell us of air that flows through the heart of the land to all life and creation. Tell us of breath, the first song. Tell us of words like constellations mapping our contributions to humanity. Tell us of infinity, how the universe lives in us. Tell us which stars bear our names so we no longer have to fear the night. Tell us of earth, of roots that course through the body of the land like veins through flesh. Tell us of the force that squeezed the red sand like dough to form mountains. Tell us how to build strong communities like gemstones forged under extreme pressure. We call on the desert to remember when she was the bottom of the sea. Help us understand how to be fluid like water, how to remain supple without losing our identities. We call on volcanoes to inject us with flames of imagination. Once we carried tongues burping fire, we melted metals with our minds. Tell us what we have forgotten. We are not afraid of bones. Tell us what we have lost. We are not afraid of remembering. Tell us what has been erased. We are not afraid of time. Tell us who we once were. We are not afraid of ourselves. I believe the soul is crafted by this physical terrain. And every string remembers us. They call us by our names. I believe that we are fashioned by the fragile balance between love and pain. When your thread breaks, do you piece it together? Or do you fight change and remain the same? The threads that bind us to our dreams, the threads that lead us to our goals, the threads with which we weave our dreams, the threads that tie us to our fears, the needles that pierce our hearts with sorrow, the threads that link us to our pasts, the threads we climb to reach our futures, the threads we break in violent acts, the threads that bind us. When your thread breaks, do you piece it together? Or do you fight change and remain the same? We've come to the edge. Don't stare at the precipice too long. After all the bets are hedged, the future's fabric is formed by the hearts of the strong. The ledge is scary. Our legs are weary. And the fall to the bottom is long. How do you rise when you've never flown before? How do you believe in wings that are half formed? Quilted wings are made of discarded scraps. We sew the shards of forgotten memories into a mental map. 
one that disarms the limbs of envy every time it attacks, one that propels us into flying forward when the wind forces us back. We are heading towards the exploding star that heralds the end of days. We're shedding the traps of ill-fitting norms, experimenting with the lines formed. When you break form, we have entered the time when work is love, and love is a product of play. These are the hours to reach for what is worth rising for. These are the hours when visions are made. These are the hours that every human being can create. These are the hours when the past is a shape-shifting canvas and today is ours to make. These are the hours when choice cannot be denied. Responsibility is a dare we take. These are the hours when the lines of lies are no longer concealed. The cloak of smoke is exposed to be fake. No one stands up for those who choose to take a stand. No one holds you or consoles you. No one grabs your hand. All you get is what was gotten by those who've gone before you, one single silken strand. The pearl of owning that you did dive into what had to be done. You listened to your heart's command. We are living through a moment that I think many leaders, many of our activists, many of our future forecasters, our healers, our seers, we are living through multiple revolutions that are happening in the world right now. Certainly the events of the last week in South Africa have been predicted for as long as people who care about this country have been speaking about inequality. The pressure cooker in which we have existed in has not been sustainable. And we've seen the outcome of that play out. Um, but it's not just South Africa. We are in a moment of, of reckoning globally. Just in the last couple of days and weeks, we've witnessed insurrections in South Africa, in Swaziland, Haiti, the people of Haiti have been protesting for the last two and a half years. The people of Cuba are, are protesting their dictatorship. The people of Brazil have been protesting for the last year. We've seen since COVID protests in Uganda. We've seen them in Zambia. We've seen them in Nigeria. We've seen them in Zimbabwe. And we are going to see more. Um, poet Chris Abani, Nigerian poet and author Chris Abani, speaks about how we are in a time where multiple intersectional revolutions are taking place. Um, we are witnessing the, the collapse of patriarchy. We are witnessing the collapse of white supremacy. We are witnessing the collapse of heteronormativity. We are being forced to ask ourselves very difficult questions about class as we witness the collapse of capitalism. And I don't mean that this will happen overnight, you know. COVID has forced us to look at glaring fault lines in global governance in real time. No one could have anticipated that COVID was happening, but many people have been speaking about the injustices that COVID has highlighted all over the world. We are also, as we sit here, the beneficiaries of generations and generations of survival and struggle. Those of us who are sitting in this room tonight have access to unprecedented opportunities. If you are on planet Earth right now and you have had access to education, you have a passport and you travel, or well, in a pre-COVID world, you traveled, um, you have food, water, and shelter, you live in a place where you have access to basic human rights, you have access to Wi-Fi and the internet so that we can have this conversation, so that we can be in one room in different parts of the world. That puts you in an infinite minority. And being a part of that infinitely privileged minority automatically means that we have a deep investment in the power structures of the world because we are sustained by them. 
I don't like to think of myself as belonging to the same elite class as as Bill Gates and as Elon Musk, who is sitting on the, in, in space right now. But in terms of what I have access to, we belong to the percentage of the population that is in the minority, that is able to access the same kinds of resources. What does that say? Um, it means that we, as, as Africans, um, as the beneficiaries of the opportunities that we have had access to, that our existence as exceptions to the rule is deliberate. The, the African middle class, the African elite was created deliberately in order to be a buffer between the haves and the have-nots. And we know that the have-nots outnumber us. I mean, by, by, by tens and tens and millions, you know, we know that and we have known that. Um, we have a vested interest in the power structure that has created us, that has educated us, that has given opportunities to us, that sustains us, even while we know that that power structure hurts us, harms us, oppresses us, has oppressed the people that we come from psychologically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. We are a part of a force that is being dismantled before our eyes, and that same force is the force that gives us access. So by virtue of who we are and the positionality that we occupy, we are already living in a contradiction. Are we prepared to dismantle the source of the same power that sustains us? I think that's an incredibly difficult question. I don't think that any other generation before us has had the opportunity to answer that question in the way that we are being forced to confront that question. Um, I think about how just a couple of years ago, the name, the evocation of the name Mandela in certain circles became a very convenient scapegoat for choices that were made, that many of us were invested in, that have now turned out to be glaringly painful for many people in our society. And unfortunately, the Mandela name has had to carry the burden for those choices, right? So when we talk about the economic compromise that was made in this particular country, when we talk about uh, CODESA, and the clauses in the constitution that protect private property. When we talk about the land issue, which has been a central uh, debate for a for, for hundred years in the society from the, from the land act, right? But the concessions that we made when we were negotiating our democracy to say that those people who have built factories and bought land and those people who own the means of our production, who own, who own our farms, you will be able to keep your things. We, we will not challenge your material wealth. We'll, through policy, we will try to incorporate more people into the economy to be able to transform the, the landscape of the economy, but we will not touch the hereditary beneficiaries of wealth that was gained through colonialism, apartheid, and violence. Mandela has become, Mandela became at a certain point the scapegoat for that decision. And I think that was very unfair. Um, and I also include myself as, as part of the tweeting classes who were very quick to call Mandela a sellout until this moment of reckoning. What distinguishes a leader, I think, from ordinary people is being able to stand as a fulcrum in your own truth and that truth becoming a, a lightning rod, a, a measuring stick that we keep coming back to, to measure ourselves, to understand our own morality, to understand how far we've come. The events of this week and looking at how deeply fractured and polarized our society is and how those fractures are also mirrored all around the world, you know? Um, having to stare those fractures in the face 
and realizing that we have not moved in terms of our trauma and our morality in this society. We have not really moved in terms of our heartscape in the last 30 years. How quickly we were transported back to 1993 in this country. How quickly we reverted back to our silos of racism. How quickly we converted back into the comfort of othering other people, violently so. It makes me think once again about the decision that former President Mandela made to give himself over to South Africa and to the world as a symbol, as a vessel that can hold contradiction and complexity. It's an extraordinarily, it's extra an extraordinarily difficult decision and also a dehumanizing decision, I think. He, he, he deliberately chose to make himself a symbol and in becoming a symbol, in a way dehumanized himself, Mandela couldn't be a man, couldn't be a human being like the rest of us. His flaws, he couldn't be as flawed or as uh, riddled with mistakes and, 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 and problems as the rest of us. You get held to a higher standard when you become a symbol, but he chose to embody that because that's what it took for us to be able as a nation to imagine that these disparate forces could coexist as one entity. A human being had to make that kind of a sacrifice. And I don't mean to say that when I say that, I don't mean to erase the contributions that were made by millions of people. I don't mean to erase the contributions that were made by thousands of leaders. I don't mean to erase the, 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 the many individuals who also sacrificed themselves, sacrificed their childhood, sacrificed their lives and their sanity for us to be able to achieve democracy. I am not taking that away. But there is one Nelson Mandela who represents what he represents in the world. To be able to spend 27 years in jail and decades more fighting the injustice of racism and apartheid in this country, and then turn around and sit with your enemy. How many of us can do that? Are we capable of that? South Africa has shown us today that we are not capable of it. America showed us with the coup that took place earlier this year that they are not capable of it. The violence that is erupting all over the planet, the rise of the right wing all over the world, it, in, it, particularly in Europe and in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in the West, in America, the rise of an organized, um, active, public, visible right wing that is characterized by xenophobia, that is characterized by homophobia, that is characterized by white supremacy. The rise of these forces show us clearly that we are a polarized world and that when people give themselves permission to indulge their lowest selves, many people are willing to run with that. And Nelson Mandela was not. It doesn't take away his flaws as a human being, you know? It doesn't mean that every decision that he made was perfect, but to sit with the, the challenge of holding your enemy as part of yourself is the kind of realization that can only come with intense self-reflection and compassion first and foremost for the self. The language and the tools that are going to get us out of this period of polarization that we find ourselves in, where fractures are being amplified, where, can't, where lines are being drawn. Um, and we see this all over our culture, particularly on social media, you know? Um, we see this in, in, in cancel culture, you know? I mean, cancel culture has many pros and has many cons. Without cancel culture, would we have been able to, would we have been able to bring justice to so many rape victims? Would Harvey Weinstein be in jail? Would Greg Maluka and Fresh have been forced to resign from their jobs without cancel culture? I don't think so. But at the same time, as a tool, it is incredibly limiting. Um, it creates uh, a world in which the, the woke and the worthy wield uh, the tool of, of, of being able to judge everybody else. Um, and at whose expense? Because 
None of us are, are perfect in our politics. None of us are perfect in our personal evolutions. The language of the language of violence will only be undone by tools and that allow us to seek and manifest and create healing will only be undone by the language of a heartscape that we are too scared to touch. And what does that mean in terms of consequences? What happens to people who are able to hold this complexity? What happens to people who are able to introduce this language of healing or people who are able to find compassion for their enemies? It means that if you introduce this into the mainstream, if you introduce this into your workplace, if you introduce this into your life in this moment of history, you are going to receive intense backlash. This is not what the culture is ready to accept or face. Um, but at the same time, it is absolutely what the culture needs. And this is what I've been reflecting on very heavily in the last week, that what makes Nelson Mandela's philosophy and decision and leadership praxis so profound is that it was so forward thinking, so all encompassing, so visionary. Um, it was a spiritual principle that he was putting into existence. And, and that is rooted in a truth and love and self-compassion and compassion for the enemy as well, that it remains, it stands the test of time. It becomes like, he becomes like the center of a tree and we grow around this cho these choices, like rings around a tree. We keep coming back to it to measure ourselves, to measure our own growth. In this moment, that decision is radical. In this moment, the decision to hold two forces that would kill each other becomes, sure, it, it's, it's a terrifying choice, but it is, it's the most noble choice that I can imagine in this moment. And I don't know if there is any other single figure who could be able to hold that role right now, nor do I think that there should be, because as we witness the collapse of, 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 of capitalism and white supremacy and patriarchy and all of the other systems of power that are connected to these forces. We are also looking at, um, we also have to rethink governance and rethink the nation state itself. The nation state as a concept is born out of all of these forces. The nation state and capitalism go together like hand in hand. It, our systems of governance need to be reimagined, revisited. Are there ways of organizing human beings beyond the nation state? I mean, these are the questions that I've been asking myself over the last couple of days is, does this entity serve us? But what I still keep coming back to is that no matter how we organize ourselves as human beings, no matter how we organize our systems of governance, we will still have to live in a world where duality will, will have to find something beyond binaries. We'll have to define something beyond us and them, beyond black and white, beyond these polarities, if all of us are gonna coexist. And this is what makes Mandela's decision and his life and his philosophy exceptional. Think about how, I think about the work that we failed to do in our post-democratic, uh, post-colonial societies. We acknowledged that our histories have had an ad adverse effect on us in every possible way. We acknowledge the trauma of our histories, but we did not go into the, we did not go into um, the process of doing the granular work of, of, of reteaching ourselves how to function and coexist. We didn't do the healing work. We didn't do the therapy work. 
We didn't do the diversity training as deeply as we should have. We didn't do the work of deep democracy. As soon as we acknowledge the trauma, we should have had a culture in this continent of people being in therapy. We should have had a culture on this continent of people examining their traumas and using their traumas as a way of excavating uh, ourselves in order to catalyze our healing as a society. The trauma will tell you where to go. The wound will tell you how to heal it. The darkness will tell you how to find the way to the light. But if you're lying to yourself about what the trauma is, you can't do that. Therapy is hard. The work of transformation is hard. It is day-to-day, -day, rigorous, deep work that will excavate the parts of yourself that you do not want to see. It will strip you naked when you are embroiled in that kind of a process. You have no choice but to find compassion because all of us have to look at parts of ourselves that we hate. All of us have to look at parts of ourselves that are oppressive or towards ourselves and others. All, all of us have to look at parts of ourselves that are dishonest. All of us have to look at parts of ourselves that are willing to compromise our standards for the sake of being able to get along and go along. And I, I mean, no more, that is no more evident anywhere else than in Africa's elite and middle class, because we are very well aware of the fact that our reality is propped up by the day-to-day -day lived experience of the poor on this continent. We know that, and we make excuses for it, and we dress it up in all sorts of different ways. I mean, I've dressed it up for many years by telling myself that I am woke, and I am an artist, and I am an activist, so I'm actually doing the work of change, but I am invested in my middle classness as much as my white neighbors. When Rome burned this week. I also had a deep investment in wanting to be protected behind my high walls and electric fence and gate and alarm system. These are the contradictions that are evident in my own life. Can I hold space for myself? If I can hold space for myself, then I can hold space for my enemy. And it's not something that I like to hear. It's not even something that I would, you know, I know as I, as the words fly out of my mouth, I, you know, I can hear the backlash coming. It's not our responsibility to educate. It's not our responsibility to do the labor of, of educating our oppressor. It's not our responsibility to do the labor of educating those who have traumatized us, which is also true, which is also true, which is also true, you know, having to stand in your own oppression having to experience your own oppression and heal from your own oppression. And then still, while you are being oppressed, having to educate your oppressor is added labor and it's not fair. But who is going to do it? Because your oppressor does not have the tools. If our oppressors had the tools, we would have better leaders, we would have a better world. They don't know how, they have not done it for themselves. They cannot do it for anybody else. The apartheid government was corrupt, the colonial governments on this continent were corrupt. The free governments have become corrupt because the institution of governance itself is corrupt. So you have traumatized people who have been fighting a liberation movement, whether it is, you know, people in, in Kenya or whether it is people in Mozambique or whether it is people in South Africa or Zambia or Angola or wherever. Traumatized from the war, coming in, taking over power, but you've never dealt with the trauma. So what do you do? You, you, you take on the shape of the institution that you find yourself in, which was built to sustain corruption. You cannot transform an institution unless you are willing to transform yourself. And that is hard work. So again, I come back to who is going to do that work? Who is going to do that labor? Whose responsibility is it to have a vision for, for the society beyond what we can see? The era of empires was defined by kings, defined by heroes who sit in palaces in order to get people to believe and invest in the notion of an empire or even the nation state. You have to get people to invest in this idea of a figurehead, a godlike figure, a leader who exists outside of ourselves, somebody who has more resources, more brilliance, more of whatever it is that we don't have in order to be able to guide us and to rule us and to lead us, you know? 
I think as we watch the crumbling of these institutions that have propped up oppression in society, we are also watching, witnessing the crumbling of the idea of leadership that we are invested in. History is not going to produce another Mandela. There won't be another figure like that because the, the systems of societal organization and oppression that enabled us to buy into these saviors, that is what is falling apart. There is no savior outside of you. There is no magic leader who is going to appear outside of you. There is no one who is going to deliver us from this reality. It is literally up to us. And the, 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 our ability to be able to respond to this moment will be defined by the will be defined by how much we have invested in our own healing, in our own transformation. How we see ourselves is how we see the world. When you change yourself, your world changes. When you heal yourself, your entire vibration changes. The way that you see the world, it changes completely. If you're trying to look at a new environment with old eyes, you will see the same You'll see the same exact things that you've always seen around you. So what we are demanding, what, what this moment is demanding is for us to do for ourselves what our predecessors were unable to do for themselves so that we can start with here to give it to the world. It cannot happen unless we start to do our own healing work. It cannot happen until we process our own trauma. It can't happen until we process the violence that we've experienced. It can't happen until we process the intergenerational violence that we have inherited. It can't happen until we, we process how uh, the sense of unworthiness that we feel that allows us to diminish ourselves. And when we feel diminished, to act out in violent ways. We have a deep investment in violence and that violence is you see it everywhere even people who care about social justice will go about seeking social justice in violent ways i mean this is what we see with um politically progressive you know so-called woke people on social media Yes, the politics are inclusive. Yes, the politics are about bringing marginalized people into the center. Yes, you are agitating for the inclusion of people with disabilities and people who are queer and women and poor people. It's right, but the tools that you are using are violent. The means that you are using are violent. The language that you are using is violent. Where is this going to take us other than us repeating what has been done before the pathway from revolutionary to corrupt leaders how many times do we how many times do we need to see that we have seen our predecessors live that in real time not because they are stupid not because they started with those intentions even you know i i don't even know if they truly see themselves as they are i don't think that they do but what is evident is that they did not do the healing work to transform their own trauma, to transmute their own trauma into a new reality. This is what we have to do. And I know that it feels like, it feels like additional labor, you know, on top of a whole pandemic, on top of an Armageddon, on top of multiple insurrections taking place all over the planet, on top of climate change and the, the flooding in Germany, on top of all of it, on top of all of it, you have to do the work of healing yourself. That might be the greatest gift that you give to the world going into therapy or, or submitting to whatever process it is that will allow you to be able to excavate yourself and transform your life. That is the greatest gift that you can give to leadership in this moment. That is how you become your own Mandela. History won't produce another single figure like that ever again. But what I believe we are being asked to do right now is to stand in and embody that each of us as individuals for ourselves so that we can give it to the world. Mandela had the gift of, and the curse, the, 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 the curse of 27 years in prison. And he, autom he 
often referred to how that period of imprisonment became an opportunity for self-study, an opportunity for self-mastery, an opportunity for self-reflection. When, when Winnie Mandela was incarcerated um, and went into solitary confinement, he speaks about that, that, that this is a gift that you have been offered, that the cell gives you a chance for self-examination. Use it as that. I, I think without that, I don't think that we would have been the beneficiaries of a man who was able to reconcile with his enemy. Which enemies do we have to reconcile with? Everybody. Nobody measures up to perfect political standards. Nobody, we, and we, there's no one who can be chucked out at this stage. All of us are going into the promised land. What are we, the, the condition of, the nervous condition that we are living through is, is also one of exclusion, you know? People feel marginalized, people feel othered. Even those who have power, even those who have material wealth are still terrified and feel othered. How are we going to create a society that is able to encompass, um, that is able to, to, to encompass and include all of its elements, that is able to, to really see into the wound um, and to see into the wound of the oppressor. It, it's very hard for me as a woman to see how men in this country were able to take out arms and stand up for their communities to defend property when we know that every day, you know, trans people are killed, queer people are killed, GBV is rife, children are raped, but when it came to defending spaza shops and malls, our men stood up. Our men who cannot stand up for us stood up for property. What does that say? What does that say about the, the, what those men value? What does that say about we who are devalued? What does that say about how we are going to get out of this. I, I, I cannot, I, I have to in this moment imagine coexisting with my enemy because everywhere I look around me, it is very difficult to see a friend, <laughs> you know? So who am I going to stand in solidarity with if not the parts of myself and my society that I do not like? I have to believe, I have to believe that that potential for nobility and transformation, that potential for ascension exists within everybody because we've seen the most degenerate versions of each other come alive and we continue to see that. It is incredibly difficult. I, I mean, I know, I know that what I am asking is, is, oh, it's, it's not, it's not nice, you know, it's not fun. Like nobody claps for you, you know, no one, no one is gonna say, yay, you're seeing the humanity of the oppressor. You know, when, when, we, when we are on our woke high and mighty horses, these are the decisions that look like, that look like selling out. These are the decisions that look like we are protecting uh, the comfort of the oppressor, which many people have had to do in order to survive. You know, we protect white comfort. We protect uh, the comfort of those who are in power because without that, we don't survive. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about an obsequious acquiescing to the whims of power for the sake of being able to pay your bills at the end of the month. I'm talking about looking at, for example, I'm talking about looking at the extensive violence that we have seen in this society and seeing behind every gun wielding man or every person who was looting, seeing the wound. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing the hurt, seeing the hurt inside of the racism that is being spewed by people, seeing the hurt inside of the xenophobia that is being spewed by people, seeing our own hurt mirrored back at us. Um, and it, it's, it's overwhelming. 
But if there is if there is a future that is possible for the planet, and I do believe that it is, um, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us to get there. In this moment, we have a planet that is fighting back at 250 years of industrialized production that has decimated our rivers, our forests, the landscape that sustains us. If we cannot take care of the earth, how can we possibly take care of the life that comes from the earth, including ourselves? Um, so this is it goes beyond it goes beyond black and white. It goes to the very core of our humanity. It goes to it goes to the the part the most vulnerable, insecure, and fragile part of the heartscape that we have run from for a very very long time. Um, this is a language that is the terrain of trainers and facilitators. This is a language that is the terrain of therapists. This is the language that is the terrain of sangomas and shaman and healers. This is the language that is the terrain of, of women too. I think women have a huge role to play in this. I mean, one of the one of the indirect benefits of how patriarchy has devalued emotions and has created a kind, has elevated a kind of masculinity that needs to be devoid of emotions except for rage and violence. And, you know, men have been taught to suppress their emotions. Men have been taught to hide from their emotions. Men have been taught that emotions are weakness. The very same things. Uh, the very same tools, the very same uh, emotions that by default have become a strength for us as women. We are able to function in this way. We are able to understand this. I mean, I see this so clearly in the generation of women artists that I belong to in, in, my, the, in, in post democratic South Africa and certainly in the contemporary climate on the continent right now, there is an explosion of African women artists, writers, African women are dominating literature at this moment because we are able to access a language of the heartscape that men have been denied. So the very same thing that is the source of your oppression is also the thing that becomes the source of your gift if you allow it to be. If you are willing to stand like a fulcrum, if you are willing to allow time to pass around you like rings of a tree and hold on to your truth, no matter what people say about that truth. And I think that is the hard part. I mean, as somebody who has experienced intense backlash throughout my career, it is. I know that the times when I have felt like I have betrayed myself have not been when people have reacted badly to my choices. The times where I felt like I've betrayed myself have been the times when I was unwilling to stand in my own truth because I was too scared. Um, so I see Abigail saying it is half past seven now. I think I've gone on forever and ever and ever. Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm happy to wrap up right now. I would have wanted to share some more poems with you. The battery on this laptop looks like it is just about to run out. I am looking around for the charger for this laptop. I am in a house that is not my own. It belongs to my friend, so I can talk to you. Hi, <laughs> Listen, we are going to carry on. So all that okay. the guests need to do is just press refresh, and then we'll still stay here. So we'd love to hear some poems from you. Go and find your charger if you need it. You can take a yes. minute. And thank you so much. Five, ten minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me have a look around for it. I appreciate intro into the QA and then we can get into some conversations with our amazing scholars. No, what do I want to do? Okay. It takes just 26 letters to create a universe. The world is dismantled and then reassembled through the lens of a pen and verse. I have lost myself in books and then found myself in words living in a prism of imagination, a prison of silence would be far worse. I've walked through the lives of individuals 
whose eyes I've never known. I've been to cities and villages and countrysides whose skies to me have never been shown. It was in this solitary cell that my greatest gift was honed. I saw that my mind was just a shell and its abyss, simply a hole. And the hell of a heaving heavy heart is still my friend. Every story has its place and history never ends. The writer is a visionary, an architect, a godchild at play on a canvas of memories. She lies naked between the covers, her own lover, her own worst enemy. Navigating between these extremes, she is both the judge and the judged, the vile, despised and attacked, the unashamedly beloved, the ever listening friend who will tell your business when you're not in sight. She pulls the mind's commotion out of stillness in the cavern of the mind. And South Africa is a fractured mirror, a paradox of schizophrenic selves who don't talk to one another, who coexist together but don't live with each other, who fear each other, who revere each other, who loathe and pretend and try to blend in with each other. And this is the time when you can become the greatest substance of your dreams unless you live in a shack and don't speak English and don't know what this poem means. Tell me how it's possible for people who walk on gold to not know how to read. Tell me how publishers who will never taste our tongues can comprehend the words that our people need because we have never been scared of stories. The ones who uttered the very first. The ones who hand them to our children, calling the rivers of their self-worth. The ones who will write the narrative in the ear, but who won't call the ear a page. The ones who will rhyme without pens and perform without a stage. I don't have all the answers. I'm Okay, I don't have all the answers. I'm just a colonized African with a funny American accent who breaks down the Queen's English until Sesotho understands it. Still, I'm compelled to comprehend those who don't inhabit my language. I wonder if trials and translations could help them to traverse my landscape. South Africa is an old fashioned mutt who knows how to sing and knows even better how to cuss, who knows how to pray when she's about to run out of luck, who knows how to laugh really hard when the tears have run her into a rut, who knows that race is a farce because when the lights are off, everybody's fucked. And when the welts and wounds demand healing salve, words are just enough. You and I, we are the keepers of dreams. We mold them into light beams and weave them into life's seams, you and I. We are the keepers of dreams. We mold them into light beams and weave them into life's seams, you and I. No life is not what it seems. We strip the fat from the lean and find the facts in between. The visions we redeem and the agony of choice. Yours is just a mind and mine is just a voice. But when we love, we love with the heat that would rise like a song in flight on the flesh of our backs. If it's love that we lack, then we walk with the pain that we seek, the love exchange that we spite. As we walk through indecisions, rising in hope, fading in fright. We ride the crest of intuition on the journey of this life. And by the hands of the infinite, we hear the cries of the rest weighed down by their intelligence, submitting to this test. But you and I push the boundaries of reason. You and I plot the mysteries of seasons. You and I paint this history to free men. Nothing can be stopped like you and I, we are the keepers of dreams. We mold them into light beams and weave them into life's seams, you and I.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Yo, oh, thank you for bearing with me as I fight these dogoloshis that have been trying to keep me away from you. Just says, never baloke. 